and again we start. I uh, realized I was on the wrong internet connection. We have two different ones and um, each one has a different strength and, and um, it works better for depending upon where we're at in the house. So I had to make sure I had that. So um, we'll just keep waiting for everybody to come back on. Hey Lavinia, I hope no one <coughs> thinks that um, I'm having major technical difficulties, but <laughs> anyway. We'll wait for a few more minutes. I'm really excited about the lesson tonight. I spent a lot of time reading, and I hope uh, you had a chance to get the um, questions. I wonder what, if I hit wave, what happens. I don't know. Anyway. Okay, I know I, uh, sorry about that. Uh, this is a little rocky. I thought that the putting the do not disturb button was supposed to keep notifications from popping up, but I just checked to make sure it is on my phone and it is uh, giving me trouble. Well, not trouble, but notifications are still popping up. So, anyway, um, uh, obviously, I think everyone thinks that I'm having trouble because Lavinia is the only one I want. <laughs> That's okay. I'll wait. It's the first time. Lavinia is still the only one as far as I can tell. I wonder if I need to stop and start again? I don't know. I might be teaching to just you, Lavinia. Can you hear me? Say something, Lavinia, so I know that my screen isn't weird. stop and come back on. I don't know. Not sure what to do. I was just checking to make sure it looks okay. Well, I guess I'll get started. Me and you, Lavinia. Ah, it needed approval. Okay, yes, I'm not, I'm not approved. <laughs> so, hey, Miss Jeannie. I'm so glad we have some other people coming on now. Hope everyone's feeling well this evening this wonderful day for this evening Lord for a day to glorify you Lord I pray that this teaching that um, I'm going to be sharing tonight on James 4 Lord that it would challenge each of us and, and help us to um, to expand and to um, do more for you Lord and to um, 
consider our hearts and to consider our ways. Lord, I thank you so much for your divine wisdom and, and your insight. Lord, I pray for each of the ladies that are here um, watching uh, that um, and that will watch, Lord, for each one of us that you would touch, heal any needs. Um, just meet us where, where those needs are, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, um, I'm going to start. We're starting in James 4, um, verse 1. So, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? That's the NIV version. Um, so, I went and read a whole bunch of different versions and um, kind of got a... I don't know, it kind of almost comes off like the Amplified, but I uh, thought it was good, you know, seeing the different words um, kind of meshed, all meshed together in one um, verse. What causes unending fights, wars, conflict, and quarrels, disputes, and arguments among you? Don't they come from your selfish, hedonistic desires, your passions, your pleasures, the cravings that fight to control you, that wage war against you, that battle within you. You want bad things. This was a, uh, the, the, this version was called the easy version. <laughs> I thought this was, it was a really interesting um, term for, the, for that, the easy version. Um, you want bad things that you think will make you happy. Isn't that just it? So the, the first question that I had, if you um, had a chance to print out the questions, was what ways does Satan use to make sure the people of God are not a threat? And uh, so that is, and I had this when I was trying to use this neat little program that allows me to flash an image up on the screen. So I don't know if any of you have ever seen the uh, movie um, uh, The Grinch. Uh, it stole Christmas, and so he's sitting and he's, he, he goes, oh. he got his fingers going and his little antennas are going like this. Anyway, um, so scheming. The devil schemes constantly. Um, scheming is also defined as given to or involved in making secret or underhanded plans. That is what Satan does in order to make sure that we're not a threat. So what is he doing? The first thing that I, I wanted to bring out, and you might have thought I've got three different um, categories, I guess you would say, that I um, did some study and research on. Um, but the first one I wanted to bring up was is found in Exodus, in uh, Exodus 1.10. And that scripture is, Come, we must deal shrewdly. We are going to scheme. Deal shrewdly with them, and they will become, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies. They will fight against us and leave our country. So this is all in Moses' time. Um, and, you know, this is a, Egypt can be a type and a shadow of our spiritual enemy in this story. And so, you know, they were, they were worried that the, that the people of God were becoming numerous and powerful and, and just spreading, you know, across the nation, taking over a vast area of land and resources. And so what did they do? What did Egypt do to deal shrewdly? They oppressed them. Now, oppression is in the news a lot right now. But oppression is not just slavery. Slavery can be physical, and, and, and that's, we can see all over the world. Hey, Amanda Hammond. Hey, Miss Betty. And if I missed a few of y'all that were earlier, I'm sorry, but I'm going to try to, if I see your name pop up. And if y'all have something to say, please mention it. But, um... The, the Christians, uh, this is happening even now. You know, it's, it's the, you know, the Christians in Iran 
and um, other Muslim uh, controlled countries and in China, communist controlled countries are being persecuted because of the power. That's one way to make Christians or the people of God is to try to make them not a threat. Is, is they feel threatened, and so what do they do? They kill them, they enslave them, they oppress them in any way that they can. Plant Parenthood oppresses, they kill, they slay. Acts 7.19 is talking, it's referring to the, um, the story in Exodus as well. He says, he dealt treacherously with our people and he oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. That is physical and spiritual. It's, yes, there's a physical threat that abortion brings and that this has happened through history over and over and over again. It is, it is nothing that is new. Hey, Miss Janice, I'm so glad you joined us. Um, and then in Zechariah 10.2, says, The idols speak deceitfully. The diviners, they see visions that lie. They tell dreams that are false. They give comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wander like sheep, oppressed for lack of a shepherd. So that's, that's one thing that happens is, is they, there, there's deceit. There's, um, you know, trying to lead people astray. And all that does is it makes people just wander aimlessly. And how true is that of Christians in today's culture that they have no shepherd. They're oppressed. They're oppressed because of a lack of a shepherd. Um, that they can trust, that are not going to lead them astray, that they're not going to give them false dreams and false visions. So that's one thing that Satan does. Another thing that he does is he causes division. And in um, 1 Timothy 6, 4, Hey, Garland, um, they are conceited and they understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, and suspicions. First, uh, I mean, not first, Second Timothy 2.23 says, Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know that they produce quarrels. So if we go back to James, and so it says, What causes these fights and these quarrels? So we know that Satan is doing, has certain schemes that they, that he employs in order to make the people of God um, threatless, um, harmless. And so that is one of the, the, you know, the main things is through division because of quarreling and arguing and if that's not rampant today, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, and as much as we disagree on things, as much as we may not, and this is something, you know, I have dealt with in my heart heavily in the last few months with everything that's going on, is the constant barrage of opinions and arguing. And, and I had the opinion for a time that, well, you have to get your opinion out. You have to let it be known. You have to say what it is you believe because then everybody else is gonna believe, is gonna be saying what they say. And, and so the decisions are gonna be made because you say nothing. And there is a time to speak up. And silence can be damaging. And I'm, so I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with speaking up, hear me well, but the constant barrage of opinions and stating your opinions and arguing, especially when it's fruitless, when somebody's not going to change their opinion, that is what is so damaging to Christians today. That the, the church world is so divided uh, about masking and about 
um, you know, whether or not to send their kids back to school and whether or not all lives matter or black lives matter or blue lives matter or Christian lives matter. All lives, you know, it's so it, it, it's all of these arguments and all they're doing nothing but creating dissension, even in God's people. Temptation and sin is the, um, the third category that I um, did some research on and that I feel like it's a big one that causes the people of God to become harmless, to become um, purposeful, per, perpless, per, no, I can't get that word, without purpose. <laughs> there we go. Um, 1 Timothy 6.9. Those who want to get rich, they fall in tempt into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Numbers 15.39 says, You will have these tassels to look at and you will remember the commands of the Lord that you may obey them and not prostitute yourselves by chasing after the lust of your own hearts and eyes. You know, when I, when I decided to use this scripture as one of my, um, you know, justifying scriptures, one of my, uh, to, to show this in, in the word of God, you know, I was thinking, you know, this is a kind of an odd scripture to use because it's so um, outward and what could be construed as um, in today's culture of religious activities that are outward only, okay? But there is some benefit. Um, and, and so why would God do that? Well, he explains it right here. So that it was his tool to give them so that they would remember every time they saw that tassel, that the whatever they had coming down in front of their faces. And it was a constant reminder for them to have their minds and their hearts set on the Lord, to not be led astray by their desires, by their fleshly desires. And sometimes I think that's what we need. We need something that will physically remind us, a rubber band to pop on our skin, something that We'll, we'll, every time we look at it, it's a reminder, do not let your eyes stray. Do not pick up that extra donut. <laughs> do not eat that other cookie. Do not, um, you know, do that thing that, that is, is what you want to do. That's a selfish desire. And when we tempt, we're, you know, led into, t into temptation and to sin. Uh, James 4.2, hey Linda, how are you? I'm glad you were able to join us. James 4.2 says, you desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask a God. So, you're reading this expanded after comparing it in multiple versions. Um, I didn't do this with every scripture, but I did this with a few because I, I thought the different versions were quite interesting. You desire, long for, wish for things, people, emotions that you don't have. So you kill, murder, destroy. You covet, you're envious, you're jealous of what others have, and you cannot get. So you quarrel, battle, war, fight. When desires are unfulfilled, what is the conclusion? This was the question that I had on, on the, um, the printout that I, that I gave. Um, think, I want you to think specifically, and I, I wanna give everyone a moment to um, if you'd like to give a your response to type in a response here think specifically among the following topics sexual desires control desires or needs that are also desires so what happens when desires are unfulfilled 
what is the conclusion? If anybody has something they'd like to say, hey, Miss Mary Ann, I'm glad you were able to join us. Um, then I, I would like to hear if anybody has any comments or anything that anything that they think here um, among those um, topics. Sexual desires, control desires, needs that are also desires. When they're fulfilled, what happens? What is the conclusion? I'm going to give everybody just a minute in case anybody's typing. Jody says, you become bitter and angry. So when the desire is unfulfilled, you become bitter and angry. That is so true. Very, very true. Um, especially control desires, I think. I mean, that it happens in almost, it can happen in any type of desire, but control desires, I feel like, when you don't feel like you have control over your life, it can really lead to bitterness and anger. Just to give it another minute. Janice, Miss Janice says, you hate and you covet. It turns to hate. That's good. Um, so, you know, if I am um, desiring a relationship with someone who it, it would, as the other scripture said, um, the other version for verse one, you want bad things that you think will make you happy. So it's that guy you think's going to make you happy, but it's not going to make you happy. Um, and that person continues to deny you, reject you or whatever that can turn to hate for that person. Um, Miss Jody says, or it can cause you to manipulate others. Yeah, Miss Jeannie says you can become envious. Absolutely. One of the ones I want to um, bring up is that specifically needs that are also desires. So we have physical needs, and those needs, when they're not met, such as you have a need for food, food is a real need and you must have it. And when it's not met, it can lead to hoarding. It can lead to an overindulgence. It can lead, any, anytime you've heard of people who have led a, a severe um, life of poverty or lack of deprivation, that all of a sudden, if they have those things, it can, the pendulum can swing to the other side. And now it's a controlling part of their life. Um, the, the, the need, every human, every person has a need for companionship and love. That's the way God wired us. But when that need is not met, whether that's because of daddy, um, lack of daddy, lack of parent love, lack of, um, uh, you know, that affection from a strong family um, or from a spousal um, person, that leads to lust. So that, that need can bring a healthy relationship and a true love. But if it is not fulfilled and it goes the other way and people get hurt, then it turns into lust. And when you're acting out on these things, um, <laughs> Miss Jeannie, leads to a widowhood. You get angry and you kill somebody. That's very, maybe your husband, very true. Not your husband, I didn't mean that. Oh, gosh. Um, but... Uh, Lust leads to murder, just like you said, could, can lead to widowhood um, or um, abortion. You know, when, when our, our needs turn selfish, we act out in selfish ways. Um, James 4.3, we're going to move on. Uh, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So I want to combine this with the end of James 4.2. I'm going to read that again. 
It says, you do not have because you do not ask God. And when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your own pleasures. So my question here is, what is the appropriate response to desire? Is there one? Is it wrong to desire? I want to give everybody a second to put their two cents in here. And uh, no answer is wrong. So there's no judgment on if you say yes or no. <laughs> so, um, but what, you know, what is the appropriate response? Is it wrong? Is it wrong to desire? Now I'm patient. I'm I'm waiting for people to type. Type 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 type. I'm gonna wait just a couple more seconds and see if anybody has a comment they want to put, and I need to swipe one of my things up. Lavinia says it is only, if it is only for a selfish pleasure or gain, it leads to destruction, always. Very, yes, I agree with that, Miss Lavinia. Okay, I, um, I wrote down three steps. And Jody says, no, it's not wrong to desire, but we should pray God's will. You know, there was a, um, a book that um, Garland says, when desires become idols. Yes, yes, because that can so easily happen. Um, there's a book um, designed to crave. And it's, it's, it's a book, I read parts of it. I haven't read the whole thing. I know that there are probably several people that have read the book. And, um, but I read part of it and, it, and one of the premises is that it that's the way God made us, is to crave, to desire. But there's an appropriate way, and there's a, 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 a purpose on why God made us to crave and to desire. So the first thing I, I gave myself, because I like steps, I like checklist, you know. So number one, first thing you always need to do if there's a desire, first you need to ask. And so the question, the, the, the scripture verses um, that I have is um, to support asking God. During that long period, this is out of Exodus 2.23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out for their cry of help. Because of, their slave, because of their slavery, it went up to God. They asked. They cried out. The first thing you do is you petition God. You ask. Whatever that desire is, desire, you know, in, in this instance, the Israelites were desiring freedom, a, a release from oppression. So the next thing that you do is reveal the motivation, God. So if in this particular story... Well, what's the motivation? It's to be released from oppression, released from um, slavery. So, but you should, even in things that, that look as if like, well, duh, of course you should, you know, that's a, of God. No, God doesn't want anybody to be enslaved, okay? But ask, and then examine your motivation is your desire for freedom from a certain situation and we're not going to we're going to use this liberally here for freedom from your current job okay let's get real for freedom from your marriage for freedom from whatever that thing is you want released from what is your motivation and then the third thing is, is if it's selfish, don't request it. 
Joshua 24 7 and I like what Miss um, Mary said do they align with the seven pillars of wisdom that's what we Jerry talked about last week um, last Wednesday was those seven pillars um, of of wisdom and uh, I want to see if I can find that exact scripture because I'd like to read those again uh, James, I'm trying to I don't have my quick nifty uh, phone Bible phone so I've got to look and when you get out of habit of turning pages Hebrews James that was in chapter 3, I think. It's here, it's two kinds of wisdom. Let's see. Let me see. The wisdom comes from having this first off. Uh, I don't remember specifically because I think she had two different places. She was talking about the pillars of wisdom. But 17, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first all pure. Then it's peace-loving, considerate, submissive full of mercy and good fruit. It's impartial, sincere, and peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Hey, Amber, glad you could join us. And I'm telling hey to everyone. So when somebody comes in, they don't feel like they're being um, singled out, but. <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, in Joshua 24, seven, it says they cried out to the Lord for help and he put the darkness between you and the Egyptians he brought the sea over them and he covered them you saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians then you lived in the wilderness for a long time it's another instance of crying out to the Lord for freedom from oppression so what was the motivation are you um, cry are you crying out for release from something that's just selfish or it's a true oppression a true um, restriction enslavement type mentality or situation or are you just unhappy in your job isaiah 7 11 ask the lord your god for a sign whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights and this is something i can add as a little side note into the ask god don't be afraid to ask god for a sign that will help you know for sure if it's God's will or not. This is instance after instance in, in scripture of um, God telling it was king, you know, and it's really funny because I read this in a historical um, Christian fiction, like it, it, about um, uh, Isaiah's daughter and King Arab. It's not Ahab, because you have the king Ahaz. There was an Ahab and an Ahaz. They, they were very, very similar. Tiffany and I had this conversation where I, I got really, because they, they reigned all within a generation of each other, and one was Israel and one was Judah, <laughs> and one had Jezebel, and they were both evil kings. And so I'm thinking, well, wait, he had Jezebel, but this book's saying that anyway. So I'm going off well, way on a tangent here, but in, in um, this book, I read was um, and and it brought me back to um, in Isaiah where God told um, Ahaz ask me for anything a sign and he was to prove it was something it was a prophecy that Isaiah had given to King Ahaz and so ask me for a sign to prove that what I'm saying is true and then again it happens again um, uh, with uh, David and with Gideon, uh, Gideon and the fleece. Um, and then it's this, there's multiple instances in the new Testament, but I can't think of what they are off the top of my head. So if somebody else can think of one, pop it up on the screen and I'll make sure everybody knows about it. So, um, Matthew seven eleven says, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him so no desiring god wants to give you good things he wants to bless us and so asking god say god is it selfish 
So you're looking and say, okay, so God's put a calling. He's put a ministry in your life. And there's something that would make that um, calling and that ministry um, more effective or more efficient or, or, what, or, or whatever. Well, but it could also be something that will that you will enjoy some um, material item that will make your you know your job easier such as maybe god has led you to um adopt orphans and 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 foster kids or help children out well i mean you may be praying for a bigger house well yeah that could be a selfish desire or it could be one to help the calling that God has placed on your life. And so, depending on the motive and what's in the heart, and that's, that's what you need to, to examine and ask God to reveal to you. Um, and, and that's where it says in Matthew 9, 38, this also kind of ties into that. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, this is specifically referring to people, of course, um, you know, that Lord, you know, send your workers out. But I believe this can also be tied to the tools in order to um, have the harvest, to, to reap the harvest. Uh, whatever is needed to, to reap that harvest field. So the workers need the tools. And apparently I had a disconnection there for a second. I'm hoping everybody's still good. Um, so that is something. So ask God reveal the motivation, and then don't ask if it's selfish. Read, um, so in James 4.4, 4, it says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world because, becomes an enemy of God. Expanding on that, you flirtatious, adulterous, faithless, disloyal people. Don't you know that friendship, loving, companionship, fellowship with the world means enmity against, hostility towards. Oh, that's, to me, that's a really strong word there. Um, or hating God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy, becomes an adversary, an opponent, a rival, a challenger, or an opposer of God. So, how do you become an enemy of God? And what happens to enemies of God? So let's start with first, how. How does somebody become an enemy of God? So I wanna give everyone a couple minutes just to type, 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 and um, put a response of how you feel, how do people become enemies of God? Lori, I don't think I said hello when you came on. It was in the middle of a sentence and then got distracted. So, hello, Lori. Glad you could join us. Robin says, the way you become an enemy of God is you become a friend of the world. Yes. And what happens to enemies of God? That's what I want to discuss right now. Psalm 68, 21. Miss Jeannie says idolatry. They're very good. That's a, a precise example of how. So you become a friend of the world by idolizing something. I do believe in you know we can idolize money and you know anything that couldn't become desires of the flesh um but i do believe there's a different um level 
and, and I may, you know, this may be something that's just a personal thing and it, you know, others may not agree with me, but I think that there is a, there is a level of uh, intensity of um, when it's actual worship. Uh, when somebody has taken that idolatry and is worshiping it as if they're a god. Um, you know, we, we can worship something just because of the amount of time we give something, so we give it importance, but in our heart, it's not like we're saying, that's my God. But there comes a point in time in many people's lives where they finally come around and say, that is my God that money is my God, or my, um, this woman or this man is my God, and, and, and no longer that is what I worship, and, um, you know, or an actual religion, another, um, another being that, that is worshiped, um, especially, you know, I, I think of the push right now for the satanic cult and how um, absolutely you know insane it is to um, hey Lucy I'm glad you could join us um, to say that you know to worship Satan you know that's just beyond comprehension to me um, Deuteronomy 31 17 says and in that day I will become angry with them and forsake them. I will hide my face from them and they will be destroyed. Many disasters and calamities will come on them. And in that day they will ask, have not these disasters come on us because our God is not with us? Now, I believe there are some occasions when God does out of wrath sin calamities but i personally believe that is few and far between and it's only in very specific instances in scripture where it says that but i think most of the time when calamities when things happen because of we have become an enemy of god is because when you become an enemy of god the number one thing that happens is separation from god so there's abandonment and when you are abandoned by god because you are idolizing something else. His hand of protection is no longer over you. And now anything and everything can come at you. And so all these disasters and all these calamities sometimes are brought on just by our not giving the worship, the full devotion to the God, to Yahweh, the God of all ages. Psalm 68, 21, David says, um, and, and the, there's a couple different versions of this that I, I actually halfway laughed at, um, as extreme as they were. David says, surely God will crush the heads of his enemies and the hairy crowns of those who go on in their sins. So, you know, David can get pretty, um, pretty violent. You know, when you contrast the reign of David and the reign of his son Solomon, um, you know, David was a violent king and he was a warrior king. And that was why God said, told David that the, that the temple would not be built was because of the violence that David's reign uh, endured. Um, and that Solomon was a king of, of peace. Now, he had his own problems for sure, but... But I, I, I bring this out because sometimes the wrath of God can be fatal. It can be messy and it can be physical. Um, the the um, Acts, in Acts 5, you have the story of um, Ananias and Sapphira who lied to the Holy Spirit and fell over dead when they did that. And, um, and so there are instances, especially in the Old Testament, but there's, it's even in the New Testament. And, uh, and then in Luke 12:28, 28, 
12, 5 says, and I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him, fear him who after your body has been killed, then has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear that one. You know, it, it's, it's, it's one thing, it's to get to the point, hey, Amanda, I'm glad you joined us. It's to get to that point where, yes, you can fear the physical death, but if you haven't feared fear God, then that continues forever. So to get your mind wrapped around eternity, and that is sometimes very difficult for us to do because we're a tangible here and now people. And it's, it is difficult to do that sometimes, to get into that frame of mind, to be able to see that it's not all about the here and now. This is a moment. This is an instant. Um, but that we need to, to um, be concerned about our eternal life. James 4, 5, and I wrote on your page that this is what I consider the challenge scripture. It's, um, it's a challenge. So the NIV version has, um, says, or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Now, just about... Every single version that I read has a different way of saying this in a way that would seem like it could be interpreted. And um, so I kind of felt like there might be two different ways that this could be interpreted and neither of them are necessarily wrong. And I could be wrong about this, but I'd like to see if somebody else was able to pick it out of what they felt and I'm going to kind of read some of the other scriptures while I give y'all a chance some of the other versions of how this um of uh, versions of how this was interpreted. And so if um but if you want to write a response of of what you think this scripture means, I'd like to hear it and then we'll talk about it. But the um another version says, "Do you think that scripture said in vain, the spirit that dwells in us lusts to envy?" Or do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? Again, do this the spirit, this is kind of old English, doth the spirit which he had made to dwell in us longing unto envy. Let me see if I can find a few that are not just a rephrase with old words. Um, do you think that the spirit says to no, the scripture says to no purpose that the spirit which he has made to dwell in us lust with envy? Or do you suppose that the scripture is speaking of no purpose, to no purpose it says the spirit whom he has caused to dwell in us yearns over us, and he yearns for the spirit to be welcomed with a jealous love. Um, or do you think it's without reason that the scripture says that the spirit he made to dwell in us envies intensely? Do you suppose that the scripture is meaningless? Doesn't God long for our faithfulness in the life he has given to us? Do you doubt that the scriptures say God truly cares about the spirit he has put in us? Do you think the scripture speaks in vain? Does the spirit which has taken his abode in us desire enviously? Do you think that the scripture speaks vainly? He yarns je jealously for the spirit which he made to dwell in us. Do you think the scripture means nothing? The scriptures say the spirit God made to live in us wants us only for himself. So some of them kind of come across to me as... Um, kind of similar to Romans seven eighteen, where it says, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. 
Okay, so when it says, um, or do you think that the scripture says for that reason that he jealousy long, jealously longs to the spirit he is caused to dwell in us, that, that um, God is jealous for us to be faithful to him, to be holy, to be righteous, to do what is good. So he is jealous for our, the spirit that lives within us to be part of him, to be with him. Now, the other way I, could, I was looking at this was um, if you use Zechariah 1.14. So the angel who is speaking to me said, proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. And there's another instance where it talks about, um, then again, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all, rather because of, this is in Romans 11:11, 11, 11, by the way. Because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. So here you have the thought of God being envious for his people and he is, in this, almost the way that scripture comes across is he has, um, in their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles. God said, well, you know, I need, these people have forgotten me, so I'm going to give it to the Gentiles because I want to make them envious to come back to me. I want to make them desire to come back to me. It's it's almost, and, and, and this is putting a very human perception on God, and so this may not be... Um, really right, but you know, where you dangle something in front of somebody so that, um, and, and so that another person may see, oh, is it just like, it's like a kid never wants something until somebody else has it. Um, Garland says, um, he longs for us to be envious of what others have in, have in his spirit so that we will desire the Holy Spirit and not evil. And then uh, see more. By his grace, the Holy Spirit will be, re be revealed in us. Yes, he is envious for other people to see him in us. Um, so, I, you know, it's um, in Romans eleven fourteen. He says, I hope that I'm in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection, for in their rejection, it brought reconciliation to the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? So you have God is jealous of his people or God is jealous and desires for his people or God desires for us to just to, for, for the spirit that's inside of us individually. And that's kind of, I, I think it can go both ways, but you know, I had a difficult time. I don't know if anybody else did, you know, with this, with this scripture was studying it because, you know, it just seemed to be all over the place. But, um, um, James 4, 6 through 8 says, but he gives us more grace. And I love that. He gives us grace even when we're all over the place and don't understand stuff. <laughs> that is why the scripture says, that God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So what are the tools that we are given to be faithful children of God, to be a threat to Satan? So God has given us tools, just like he gave a tool in the Old Testament of the tassels that were hanging down over their headpiece that would remind them to um, not look to the left, not look to the right, but to keep their mind straight on, on him. Um, what are the tools that he has given us today? Um, and... This is maybe a strange scripture to use for this, but I think it can encompass a lot. 1 Corinthians 7, 5 says, Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent for a time, so that you may devote yourselves in prayer. 
Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now, I know here it really is talking about sexual desires, you know, relations between husband and wife. Um, but I want to talk about this in the context of dealing with needs that can become lust. So it is important when there are things that are, that are not necessarily wrong, they're not necessarily bad, that one of the tools that he's got is, is deprivation should not be constant, ongoing, never ending. It should have a season and a time for to devote yourself to prayer and fasting or for wholesome living or, or, or whatever. So like if you're thinking of this by food or you're thinking of this by uh, spending money or whatever, um, deprive yourself for a, by mutual consent for a time. So, cause when you deprive yourself constantly of the things that are needs, then that can become an obsession in and of itself, making it more difficult to resist it. Because, you know, it, it said, you know, then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So if you are in a diet, well, everyone knows how difficult it can be to keep that diet if you don't, if you're on a constant restriction with no room to budge. So the, to not have the, um, the temp, it, it's easier to resist if there's some flexibility on those things that are not obviously sinful, you know, that, that they are needs and they are healthy needs. They can be healthy needs. Uh, so Galatians 5, 22 through 23, of course, this is everybody, you know, this is common. Everybody knows this, the fruit of the spirit. That's what God has given us. And that's what we need to keep in front of our minds, in front of our eyes, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law. Now I thought it was interesting that that last sentence against such things there is no law. So why, why would we, of course there's no law. He can't have too much love. He can't have too much joy, all those things. But you know, in that day and age, in that culture especially, that there were laws, just like Jesus said, who, you know, that their donkey falls in a pit, wouldn't go, or their child falls in a pit, or wouldn't go and save that animal on the Sabbath, because there are laws that are meaningless, or can be. And so, you know, he was trying to, to say that there is no law when it's dealing with one of these things. Is the reason you need to do that, is it because of love or love, uh, because of peace? Well, if you need to go in a bar to rescue somebody, well, go in the bar and get them. You know, it, so there is no, um, there is no law. There is no governance there. Um, 1 Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober mind so that you may pray. So this is another tool, is prayer and soberness, being alert. Don't allow your mind to become pulled away and easily distracted. And that will help you to, to be a, um, a warrior in Christ and, and a, not the um, mat to walk on. Jane, so the last two scriptures, and I know we're about out of time. It's 8 o'clock, but I did start a little late due to my technical difficulties. Um, so James 4, 9 and 10, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So what should our response be to sin? James 3, 14 says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it. And deny the truth. One of the things that I have seen over and over and over again that I think is a 
red flag for, for the church is the tendency to make light and joke about our faults that could be even to the point of sinful on social media. Um, for instance, and I really wanted to flash this image, you know, so you could see it, but there was a, a meme. So people use memes all the time. And I'm not, I am not, you know, if you used this meme or if you've done this, something similar to it, I'm not saying that what you did is evil and wrong. I'm just saying that if you are constantly putting up jokes about your inadequacies and, and things that could be construed as sin or, or um, wrong, then maybe you need to consider and reconsider your state of mind and, and do you need to be sober about it instead of joking about it. But there was this meme, uh, it was a um, He-Man but you had the bad guy, you know, Skeletor. And so, and, and he had a whole bunch of little bitty Skeletors around him. And so it said, um, me in the morning when I'm trying to decide which one of my split personalities I'm gonna let out. Okay, and so this person was laughing about it, saying, ha ha ha, that's me every morning. You know, and, and yeah, that can be funny, but, but the thing is, is double, you know, is that something we should be proud about? Being double-minded? being, uh, uh, you know, uh, unbalanced, um, you know, prone to rages or prone to emotional um, falling apart, you know, that's not something we should boast and be, you know, oh, ha, 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 you know, no, we should be sober. Um, you know, the memes that constantly talk about our potential problems with drinking. Yeah, they're funny. Oh, yeah, I'll just, you know, I, I, and it's kind of funny, but you know, it's, it's like the, the coronavirus one that, um, you know, it's, it's the coronavirus test. Just take out a bottle of wine, sniff it. And if, if you can't smell it, you know, then you have coronavirus. But if you can smell it, then drink it the whole bottle in celebration. Well, you know, I mean, one thing, you know, that's funny. It can be. But if you're constantly making jokes about overindulgence in alcohol, that might be a red flag for you. Um, Proverbs 8, 5. You who are simple, gain prudence. You who are foolish, set your hearts on it. Seek wisdom. Allow yourself to be sober and to think about what you're doing before you do it. 1 Kings 3, 13. Moreover, I will give you so this, because in the next three scriptures going to, so that, that's, it says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. So what are the rewards for a righteous life? Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. So here is Solomon, who could have asked for anything he wanted. He asked for wisdom to rule his people well. That's the rewards of living a righteous life. And then God grants blessing upon blessing on top of that. James 1.12, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. So you have the contrast that we mentioned earlier is don't fear the one who can hurt your body. Fear the one who can send you forever to, to an eternity of hell. But that one can also give you the crown of life to uh, them that have promised, to, the, to those he has promised, to those who love him. Now, one scripture, the last scripture I have that I love this is Esther 2.17. Now, the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women. And she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Vashti, not Vashti, Vashti. How did Esther gain that approval? How did she gain that favor? By being wise, being sober, not being overabundant, by listening to the wisdom of those that are um, elders who are older than her, by 
by doing and, and worshiping the Lord God, by doing what she knew that she needed to do. And that is what won her the crown. So that's what I have. I hope y'all enjoyed. I'm so glad you joined us, Hope, and you get to watch the rest of the video later. But um, if uh, anybody has any other prayer requests or anything, I'll stay on for a second. You can pop them up and uh, we can pray for them. But I uh, was really, really excited. So glad I got to teach today. Thank you. And uh, I hope y'all got something out of it. But anyway, so I wish I could put on some music now. It's like, cue music. <laughs> so I don't think you want me to sing for you. <sighs> thank you, Jesus. I thank you for all these ladies who watch today and listen. I pray that you bless them and keep them. Pray that you bless Jody and bless Miss Jeannie, that you would uh, go before them tomorrow, Lord. And you bless Miss Garland. Lord, I thank you so much for their um, attentiveness to your word, that you would uh, just help them to recall the words that you have spoken to them in their own lives, Lord, and uh, thank you for Garland, and I thank you for Miss Janice, Lord Jesus, that you would touch Robin and you would touch Michelle, Lord. Thank you so much for that, Lord. I just praise and I glorify you for all of these ladies, Lord, and I, that your angels go aboard for them and um, any um, medical procedures, any surgeries that are happening, Lord, I just pray that you touch them and you be with them. Give them the words to say, Lord, when they are speaking as your ambassador tomorrow. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.